From KQED Public Radio in San Francisco, I'm Michael Krasny. The Trump administration on Tuesday signaled it would rescind Obama administration's guidelines for affirmative action. Whereas the Justice and Education Departments previously allowed universities to consider race in their admissions decisions, the move indicates a shift to race-blind policies. And the move comes as Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, who upheld race-based admissions at the University of Texas back in 2016, announced his retirement. And as a lawsuit alleges that Harvard University is discriminating against Asian American applicants, We discuss the blow to affirmative action, how the decision is likely to affect California's public universities, which have banned affirmative action since 1996. And joining us first is Erica Green. She's education reporter for The New York Times. And welcome, Erica Green. Good to have you. Thanks for having me. I guess the place I'd like to begin with you is uh, we're seeing essentially a reversal back to George W. Bush's um, administration where there was an attempt to essentially spell out race neutrality in admissions. And what, what, what does this mean and what does it mean generally in terms of secondary education? I mean, you know, it, it basically cements um, the Trump administration's approach to uh, civil rights, which is that the government should be a neutral party in enforcing them, um, that, it, you know, all policies should follow the letter of the law, and any agency that takes any initiative to interpret that is going to be challenged, um, as we now see with the Department of Education um, and the, to some extent, the Department of Justice uh, with these guidance documents. Um, that's what it means. It means that colleges and universities will need to interpret the law themselves. It also means that if they step, you know, over a line that the uh, Justice Department or Education Department deems inappropriate, you know, they could be subjected to, to legal ramifications and funding losses. And in some instances, actually not only be taken to court and investigated, but also lose department Education Department funding, no? Yes, that is that is um, a possibility. The, the Office for Civil Rights in the Education Department, you know, investigates any claims of discrimination, um, including, you know, any claims of reverse discrimination. And if a college or even, you know, elementary or secondary school is found in violation, there is a process for revoking federal funding. And what this means uh, for California, (laughs) where affirmative action is no longer part of the picture, uh, and that's true about a few other states, Michigan and Florida as well, where they've actually banned consideration of uh, race in public schools or public university admissions. Um, Let's let's, uh, have you uh, sort of tell us what the nuances of that may be as you see it. I mean, you know, for for the states, and I think there are about eight now at last count who already have laws on the books prohibiting race uh, to be used as a factor, I don't see much changing. Um, Many of those states, like Texas and California, after uh, these laws passed, you know, tried to be creative in their recruitment efforts so that they could still diversify their campuses, you know, offering specialized financial aid packages, um, you know, adding factors like socioeconomic status, which, you know, we all know is is pretty related um, to race. Um, you know, they'll just probably have to take, a, you know, a hard look at those additional measures to make sure that they don't, um, you know, cross the line that's been drawn by the Trump administration. Well, there are also a couple of lawsuits that I want to call our listeners' attention to now involving Harvard and University of North Carolina that involve Asian Americans uh, allegedly, uh, not allegedly, I mean the numbers are there, that show that they are, at least according to the lawsuit, being discriminated against. Uh, and could you at least address that and tell us where, what is the status of that at this point? Um, right now, from what I understand, the Department of Justice will be filing briefs by the end of the month. Um, and you know, that litigation continues, and as you probably saw uh, in our story, the Harvard University is really sticking to its guns, you know, even in the wake of this uh, guidance rescission, which, um, you know, we can, I I think at this point, directly tie to the Harvard case, Um, you know, they are pretty clear that they're still going to use race as one of the factors um, that they, you know, base their admissions decisions off of. Um, so that litigation is con- is continuing. Um, you know, it's not, uh, I don't think there is a firm date for when any decisions are coming down the pike, uh, but the Department of Justice is still engaged very much in that case. 
And Asian Americans are essentially bringing forward these lawsuits because they feel, I mean, let's just spell it out for our listeners, they feel there is discrimination and quotas involved, don't they? They do. They they believe that, you know, they these additional factors, you know, considered character factors are, you know, are putting them at a disadvantage when they are, you know, academically qualified to, to gain admission to these universities, and they do feel that, that it's being done um, in order to allow other groups, you know, not just African Americans, but, but white students as well, um, you know, to diversify campuses. They very much feel that, you know, their merits have not been enough. And, um, and that they are being discriminated against. Now, this may sound a little bit like a crystal ball type of question, but do you foresee the likelihood that uh, universities are going to try to be more compliant to this or they're just going to sort of dig their heels in and say, especially schools like Harvard, we're going to do things the way we want to do them? You know, I, I, I don't know because I don't have a crystal ball, but my reporting um, suggests that you will see a mix. Right. Um, we have schools who already have um, bans, you know, like Michigan, uh, which we cited in our story today or yesterday, um, that said they still believe uh, in the Supreme Court's <clears throat> decision. Um, and even though they have restrictions, they still try to take other measures to diversify their campuses. We had some universities who were really hesitant to say, and I think those will be the, the universities that go back to the drawing board and and see if you know it's really worth it <laughs> or if anything that they are doing um might you know flag them for a violation i think we'll, we'll definitely see a mix we're talking with erica green she's education reporter with the new york times and we wanted to get a broad picture from her and you provided it and i'm grateful for it thank you so much erica green thank you for having me we want to get into the debate of this, and John Powell is here with us in studio. He's director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society, also professor of law, African-American, and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. Director, good to have you back. Thanks, Michael. Good to be back. Uh, let's talk about what's happening here in California with this. Uh, I mean, I want to get into the history with you as well, but um, there is a, we're talking about Harvard, for example, there's a decided and dramatic difference between the number of African-American students who are here and are admitted uh, as opposed to Harvard. I mean, it's almost double here. Right. Yeah, the, the um, um, this is actually an important point. It's not just... Um, African American students, also Latino students, and underrepresented students. And Berkeley is a public university, uh, has an obligation to the public. Harvard is a private university. So one of the things that's interesting about the Harvard suit is that this is one of the first suits against a private university. Most of the attack on affirmative action and inclusion has been on public institutions. So this is different. But as you, as uh, Erica said, uh, California has its own law dealing with uh, race and affirmative action in addition to the federal law. Um, just as a footnote, the guidance that uh, the Trump administration is rescinding is not law. Uh, the law is the same. The court is very clear that you can use race in terms of um, admission policies into higher ed uh, and that diversity is a compelling government interest. So it's not a question of um, them following the law. They're already following the law. What the Trump administration is saying is that we don't like the law. We don't want you to be able to use race. The Supreme Court has said over and over again, yes, you can use race in terms of uh, promoting diversity in universities. It goes back to an order signed by John Fitzgerald Kennedy. I mean, we're talking about over a half century ago, doesn't it? That's right, although he signed an executive order, which is, has a different force than the courts interpreting the Constitution. So even, I mean, the court is fairly conservative. I mean, let's, let's, let's not be... Um, unmindful of that. So even a conservative, conservative court with Justice Kennedy leading the way has consistently held um, that you can use race to order, in order to promote diversity. Well, until 1954, with Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned Plessy Ferguson, uh, there were separate schools. I mean, a lot of people can't get that into their consciousness. Uh, I mean, for black and white, for example. Well, there still are separate schools. I mean, the court... Has de facto, really, you de, mean. Yeah. Well, even not even de facto. If you look at uh, Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, which is um, he's associated with the Haas Institute, he makes it clear that these segregated schools and segregated houses, it's not just, uh, it's not just de facto, it's de jure. We have 
explicit laws, practices that have never been disrupted, that continues to segregate housing, schools, employment, voting, and the court has largely turned a blind eye to it. So it's not, you know, sort of it's like a, uh, a trick to say, well, you know, it's sort of it's, it's segregated, but we're not making it segregated. We are, we are making it segregated. The argument uh, has always been the diversity and the global recognition and dealing with different groups and so forth. But when President Obama was at the helm, uh, he said, well, my daughters have a big advantage over, for example, poor kids, uh, poor white kids. And it wasn't as if, I mean, he was in favor of affirmative action. He wasn't trying to shift the argument or uh, anything along those lines. But he was calling attention to the fact that maybe there ought to be consideration when you're talking about diversity also for income and class as much as race. Well, um, income and class is part of race. They're not separate. And I've written a long article on that, and that's a sort of a, a false dichotomy. It's not j- just accidental that most blacks and Latinos are uh, have less income and much, much, much less wealth. That's a legacy uh, of our housing discrimination. It's a legacy of how we accumulate wealth. And there's a recent study uh, by a group of scholars, including Ross Chetty down at Stanford, which is the most ex- expansive study in U.S. history, that show even when blacks who are in middle-class homes, upper-middle-class homes with million-dollar income, two-parent households, all that, black males in particular are uh, almost three times more likely to fall out of uh, the, the upper-middle-class than whites. So race doesn't go away just because you have money. That's a false thing. Um, and, you know, we have the whole issue around Black Lives Matters, which I like to call Black Lives Matters too. Um, we have football players, basketball players, Hollywood stars who have a lot of money, millions of dollars. They still get disproportionate treatment by the police. So race is actually a factor that doesn't go away just because you have money. Let's get back to essentially what this means. I'm talking about the the attempt to roll back uh, the Obama-era affirmative action guidelines. It can mean, uh, for example, loss of student loans, can it? Yeah. You know, you know, part of the thing to understand, Michael, is that we're talking about the Trump administration. And I know you, some of your listeners may support Trump, but Trump is really hostile to uh, anyone who's not white Christian. Um, he's you know, a Muslim ban. He's talking about Mexicans as, you know, coming here to rape our women. He's picking a fight with every group. So he's pretty clear. He's not the president of the United States in a, in a serious way. He's the president of white people and conservative white people. Is that. So it's not surprising that you see him also attacking affirmative action, attacking voting rights, attacking every aspect of civil rights, his vision of America. And people may disagree on affirmative action or not, uh, but even people who might disagree, I think some people believe in an inclusive America, that America is, is not is a diverse country, um, that everyone has a role. Um, and the group-based discrimination, where you consign people to certain neighborhoods, formerly called ghettos, consign people to certain schools, uh, is wrong. And when schools and universities and neighborhoods try to address that, uh, instead of the Trump administration trying to help, uh, they actually oppose them. So without sounding partisan, you would agree with Nancy Pelosi who says this is an attack on communities of color? You know, it's, it's, yes, it's not a partisan issue. As David Brooks said, you can be conservative or you can be modern-day Republican. What he's saying is that modern-day Republicans are not conservative. Um, and so if you align yourself with uh, essentially racist, homophobic, xenophobic things, that's not partisan. If the Republican Party is doing that, then so be it. And Trump has definitely done it. He's been a really persistent in his campaign, in his presidency, in his appointments, in his policies, uh, very hostile to uh, large groups of people. John A. Powell with us, director of the Haas Institute for Fair and Inclusive Society, also professor of law, African-American and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. We're going to bring Ilya Shapiro into this discussion. He's senior fellow in Constitution Studies at the Cato Institute and editor-in-chief of Cato Supreme Court Review. And Ilya Shapiro, welcome to the program. Good to be on. I wonder if, uh, when we're talking about affirmative action, uh, if you are in agreement, for example, with uh, articles that have appeared in the National Review that say that a lot of this problem has to do with uh, non-disclosure in terms of how the decisions are made about uh, bringing race into the whole picture. Uh, Well, that is certainly a problem that uh, the Supreme Court is partly to blame for. In uh, 2003, in the University of Michigan cases, the court said that you can't apply uh, a mechanical rubric in terms of using race, a certain number of points or certain quotas or anything mechanical like that. It has to be 
purely holistic and race is one among many factors. And so nobody knows exactly how in that black box race plays. Now in the, in the Harvard lawsuit that's going on now, the, the documents that have come out, uh, both the statistical analysis and certain uh, qualitative things, it looks like there's no explanation other than simple racial balancing going on. Not that necessarily the Harvard admissions officers are bigoted uh, against Asians or, or whites or what have you, but, uh, but that the, they want to uh, kind of have uh, within certain parameters a certain balance of the, of the, of the diff- people from di- applicants from, from, from different races. And I think that's, um, uh, that's uh, unhealthy for society. And uh, does it pretty much stack up in your mind as being like quotas? I mean, for many years, of course, uh, Jewish Americans were concerned about quotas because they were indeed kept out of uh, many universities because of a specific quota that existed. Does this seem to be falling into place for you? Uh, Effectively, uh, again, without necessarily the same kind of bigotry that would have been uh, in place against Jews uh, way back when, in my Wall Street Journal article about the Harvard lawsuit a couple of weeks ago, uh, I did raise that issue, and ironically, we talk about holistic uh, review of, of applicants. That was designed by Harvard to put in these Jewish caps because, you know, beyond the paper credentials, whether GPA and, and SAT and, for that matter, extracurriculars and, and other things, there are these subjective factors that can be included, uh, how sociable you are, how much courage, quote-unquote, you display, your personality, all of these subjective factors that uh, allow wiggle room to engage uh, in that kind of racial balancing. So uh, I I wouldn't say, uh, again, that this is, uh, you know, the admissions officers are are bigoted or acting out of bad faith necessarily, but they are trying to have soft quotas, not, not a hard target per se, but uh, within within a normal range. Would you agree, uh, I wonder, with uh, Tom Sowell, conservative uh, African-American thinker who has said uh, for many years that when you have preferences, the preferences tend to grow? Uh, I don't know if they grow necessarily, um, but uh, they, they get in, 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 enshrined. They get, uh, it's, it's very hard to dislodge uh, that, that sort of thing. And um, let, let me actually follow that up also with, uh, we'll get John Paul's response to that, but can follow that up with uh, a, a little uh, view again of history from you, because I know you wrote an amicus brief for the University of Texas uh, Supreme Court case. Uh, that was uh, pretty much establishing uh, race and ethnicity um, to be involved in decisions, and it pretty much set it in stone, didn't it? Um it's, it, it, the, the law didn't really change with the University of Fisher case. Um, uh, the, the, what Justice Kennedy's opinion said was that uh, you're allowed to use race if you narrowly tailor your program, you consider all race-neutral uh, options, and you, you've done all that, you still don't achieve whatever critical mass or whatever level of diversity uh, you're, you're trying to achieve. And he approved, it's the only time he approved any use of uh, racial preferences, the, the University of Texas system, which is unique. It, uh, well, we don't, don't need necessarily go into that, but it's not kind of a a whole scale use of race across the uh, the whole admissions process, or uh, or what have you. So the the law hasn't really changed since the Michigan cases in in, in 15 years, where uh, again you're allowed to use race effectively as a as a kind of a one one factor among many uh, to uh, have a little bit more diversity, but it cannot be outcome determinative. It can't be uh, you know the the the, the deciding uh, 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 characteristic that. Lets people in that otherwise would simply not be uh, even in the discussion. You think that uh, Justice Kennedy's uh, resignation was really the catalyst to this, or was it in the works? Any opinion um, on that? The timing. Well, yeah. The uh, well, the, the timing. Uh, I, I don't think was a political decision. I mean, he's 81 years old. I'm sure his wife has been pushing him to try to retire for a while, uh, while he's still in good health and they can enjoy their later years. Um, this is one area, unlike many others, that some are either concerned or hopeful about, whether abortion or otherwise, uh, that may indeed turn, because it's been uh, him and before him, Justice O'Connor, that were kind of the linchpins of this mushy, uh, not very clear or satisfying for every for, for either side uh, rulings on uh, the use of race. And now with John Roberts becoming the median vote, he, of course, famously wrote about a decade ago in a school busing case that the way to end racial discrimination is to stop discriminating based on race. So I think this is one area where the next case, and it could be this Harvard one in a, in a, in a year or two, uh, where the court does definitively say, okay, enough. After more than 50 years of, 
of, of using race. It's uh, at this point, there's no constitutional way of doing it. Let's look at socioeconomic factors. Let's look at reducing preferences for legacies or athletes. Let's look at financial aid and outreach and all these other things without just using, you know, putting a thumb on the scales, however little or, or however in, in whatever way. Yeah, we may indeed want to hear people's uh, thoughts about this, particularly when you bring into the question of athletes uh, and uh, legacies. But le in fact, let me uh, invite you to join us in this discussion. We'd like to hear from you and like to hear your thoughts about uh, the, pr the Trump administration rolling back the Obama-era affirmative action guidelines. And uh, you can join us at our toll-free number. Let me give it to you. It's 866-733-6786. Please feel free to call in and weigh in. Again, the number to call, 866-733-6786. Where other ways to join us, you can email us, forum at kqed.org, or go to our website, kqed.org slash forum, and click on this segment, or tweet us. Our Twitter handle is at KQED Forum. We do want to hear your thoughts and any questions you might have. Let me just go briefly. We're coming up on a break here. But, John Paul, let me go back to you. What about this idea? I, I mentioned Thomas Sowell, uh, you know, that once you have these subjective things that uh, Ilya Shapiro alluded to in place, they just completely continue to spiral upward. Well, um, Michael, I don't think that's the issue. Uh, you know, yesterday was the 4th of July, and uh, the country is celebrating um, its birth. But also, you know, they've had two births. Uh, uh, Lincoln talked about a new birth of freedom. And out of that came three amendments to the Supreme uh, to the Constitution. And all, all those amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, was designed to restructure this country in terms of its uh, slavery and racial hierarchy, and we haven't done it. And so now to sort of focus narrowly on affirmative action or discrimination, when more people died in the Civil War than all the other wars combined, fighting to make this country inclusive. And we're actually backing away from that. We actually are, right now, the South is winning the Civil War, and Trump is the headmaster. Quick response from you on that, Elia Shapiro, before we go to break here? Well, I mean, this brings in, you know, much larger issues. I'm, I'm really focused on... Uh, you know, not using race, not judging people based on skin color in admissions. There's plenty of socioeconomic problems that need to be addressed and some things that, that the Trump administration is not doing and some things that it that it may do better. But that's that's uh, larger than the scope of, uh, of affirmative action in education. All right. We will get to your calls and emails. So stay tuned and stay listening. Uh, John Paul with us from UC Berkeley and Ilya Shapiro from the Cato Institute. And you, when we return on Forum, I'm Michael Krasny. Here's what's coming up on Forum in our second hour this morning. At 10, we discuss the importance of place in determining health outcomes and how the California Endowment is addressing health inequities across the state with its Senior Vice President of Healthy Communities, Anthony Eiten. And to listen to past Forum shows and subscribe to our podcast, visit kqed.org slash forum. And for the latest updates on our programs and guests, find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. We're at KQED Forum. Support for KQED comes from Too Far Media, immersive story experiences by Rich Shapiro, changing the way literature is experienced. The Too Far Media app is available in the Apple App Store and on Google Play. In our overseas allies, the president sees freeloaders. If all NATO members had spent just 2% of their GDP on defense last year, we would have had another $119 billion for our collective defense. That's next time on The Takeaway from WNYC and PRI. Stay with us. Immediately following Forum, we'll bring you the Here and Now program at 11, and The Takeaway gets underway at noon today. 
This is Forum. I'm Michael Krasny. We're focusing this opening Forum Hour on Affirmative Action with uh, John Powell, who's here with us in studio, Director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society and Professor of Law, African American and Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley, and Ilya Shapiro, who's joined us by phone, Senior Fellow in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute. And I want our listeners to join us by phone, and let me go to as many of you as I can. Let's start, Jennifer, with you. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, hi, you're on the air. Yes, my question is, um, if we want universities to be merit-based uh, acceptances, shouldn't there also be a gender blindness as well as a racial blindness on the acceptances? Let me go first to Ilya Shapiro on that. Gender blind as well as race blind? I, I think that ideally you, you would have that. Uh, we're running into some issues that uh, if you want to have kind of a normal social life at, at universities that increasingly there's so many more young women who are qualified than young men, it's starting to go the opposite way. So historically there were some preferences in the early days of affirmative action for, for women. Now to the extent gender is considered, it seems to be helping men more, although the effect is much less pronounced than with, with racial preferences. But yeah, I think I think ideally... Uh, these kinds of uh, qualifications uh, shouldn't be one that, that we look at. And Director Paul. So uh, I'm, I don't think we should have um, uh, the, the idea of having objective uh, criteria for selection to me is problematic. If you look at the, the criteria that's used, uh, including from uh, the testing bureaus, there's we haven't found one. And so Google has said, for example, looking at things like SAT scores, it considers that completely useless in terms of projecting and um, how, how people will succeed. Um, so what's the criteria that we want to use? We say, I think grades are relevant, um, but a lot of things we use are biased. And Michael, you asked the earlier question about having preferences and they're getting deeply entrenched and expanding. And to some extent, you're right. But here's the preference. The preference has in this country for almost this, almost this entire existence has been whiteness. And so how do we actually disrupt that? And the, the, three, the three amendments was designed to disrupt white preference in the, in the United States Constitution, practice, politics, economy. We still have not done it. We still have not done it. And so what affirmative action is really trying to do is to correct, uh, as Lincoln acknowledged, the, the sins of the country in terms of being organized around whiteness. And you cannot do that without addressing race. You go to a question from Peter. He wants to know, John Paul, if you can tell listeners instead exactly what procedure you think universities should use that would take race into consideration and in admissions decisions and that listeners would be likely to support. Well, they, they start with the last part of the question. What, it depends on who the listener is. Um, I believe in a fair and inclusive society. And I think a big discussion about that. It's sort of interesting. People talk now about discrimination. You look at the 14th Amendment. It doesn't say anything about discrimination. It talks about citizenship. It talks about uh, procedure. It talks about equality. Where do we get the idea of, of discrimination? SAT scores discriminate. They discriminate against those who don't do, don't do well on tests. Uh, so it's not discrimination per se. We need to have a real discussion as to what kind of inclusive, fair society we want. When Jefferson was sort of the architect of modern education in the United States, he talked about making citizens. The education system belonged to all of us. And we start with isolating kids in school. Uh, Michigan just said that not teaching kids to read is okay. And almost all of those kids they're talking about are black. And so at some point, magically, when 18, now we're going to have a fair standard. When we segregate people based by, on race, when we stop people based on race, when we hire people based on race, when we have a system, a society that's deeply in ground with race, when we had a presidential campaign that was all about race, and now it's less, now let's not look at race. When we try to correct the problems, now we're supposed to be neutral. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. We have these structures in place, these attitudes in place. Uh, we have to have a serious discussion as to what kind of society we want to have. And it's not a society where, um, you know, we don't notice when we mistreat people. Your reaction, Ilya Shapiro, to Director Powell's comments? Um, uh, well, I mean, again, we, we should have a larger uh, discussion of the, uh, improving the K-12 to educational system about over-criminalization and, and uh, police abuses and, and lots of things that affect uh, uh, minority communities. But I, I don't think that uh, 
judging people based on skin color and, and creating certain uh, pathologies on campus where the bottom quartile, bottom quarter of, uh, 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 of students in terms of academic achievement uh, on elite campuses tend to have a lot of uh, racial minorities because they're advanced uh, beyond where they would otherwise in, in the kind of the, the median scope of their, of their application qualifications would, uh, would get to. These are, these are problematic things as well, to, to use that terminology. Uh, the University of California system, when that state's voters outlawed the use of racial preferences in the late 90s, uh, found that in the first few years, there were a lot fewer black and Hispanic students at the very top UC schools, Berkeley, UCLA. But after a while, that evened out uh, because of outreach efforts, because of financial aid, uh, because of uh, kind of savvier uh, uh, guidance counselors at high schools and whatnot. And you found that at any given throughout the uh, the, the University of California system, there was no difference by race uh, based on academic achievements on those campuses. So no longer were the racial minorities, uh, except for the Asians, uh, uh, all the way uh, uh, at the bottom. And I think that's an example uh, the, of the, of the post-racial preference system uh, that would work for higher education. I mean, again, that does not address uh, any other problems in society with respect to anything from housing to K-12 education to breakdown of the family or, or anything else, you know, job availability, what, what, what have you. That's a, a much broader social discussion. But if we're simply talking about university admissions, uh, then I think uh, you're using a, a, a hammer to, to address a problem that is something other than a nail. Let me get more callers aboard here. Let me go next to you, Drew. You're on the air. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Uh, I am a teacher at a community college uh, in the Bay Area. Um, our school is very diverse. Uh, we have a, a number of students who will transfer or wish to transfer to a historically black college. Uh, I've heard uh, many positive uh, reports about that experience and, and varying reports, and I'm wondering um, how that might fit into the conversation and what the guest speakers might uh, have to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the question, John Powell. Historic black colleges and their role in all this? So a couple of things. I think they're very important. Uh, in, in large part because for uh, much of our history, certainly in the 18th and uh, 19th and early 20th century, blacks were so completely dis- excluded. And I want to just keep, keep emphasizing that has never been corrected. Uh, when we start correcting it, there was immediate firestorm against, no, no, you can't do that. And now we're supposed to be race neutral. I don't think slavery was race neutral. I don't think segregation was race neutral. I don't think Jim Crow was race neutral. I don't think anti miscegenation laws was race, race neutral. I don't think lynching was race neutral. I don't think, so at some point, you can't separate these things. Uh, and yes, I agree that, uh, one of the ways you actually deal with students doing well is have what's called a critical mass. Uh, and Justice O'Connor talked about that in, in the Michigan case. And what black schools have, or historically black schools, is they have a critical mass. And uh, it's not that students of color don't do well in these schools because they're, they can't perform. It's because they don't belong. They have a sense of not belonging. At the University of Texas, they had black students graduating three and four years later than their white counterparts. And they had all these remedial classes to get them up to speed. And when they turned attention to how the student felt, the students being feeling like this is not their place, this is a white space, this is a hostile space, and they start addressing those issues, the black student starts doing much better. Isn't that one of the arguments that's been used against affirmative action, though, that you're uh, letting students in when perhaps they're not as well prepared and it may just suffer, uh, for, uh, may them, make them suffer in terms of their own sense of ego and accomplishment and so forth? Look, being, being stopped by the police, being shot by the police, and being kicked out of your house, you suffer a lot there. You missed the point, Michael. What I'm saying is that when students, these same students, not better prepared, but and why they weren't prepared is because they've gone to underfunded, under-resourced, uh, segregated elementary schools. But when those students were made to feel like they belong, they performed. Belonging matters. And the way you feel like you belong in part, going back to your the question on the call, is you the critical mass. You're not just one. You're not just token. And that's not just true of black people. That's true of any group. Anytime you feel like your group is being marginalized and, and tokenized, uh, you don't perform as well. Uh, and the way to correct that is not to say, so we're not going to let you in. The way to pr- address that, which O'Connor talked about in the Michigan case, is to get to a critical mass. There's still, uh, though, Ilya Shapiro, and I think this needs to be stated, uh, 
and get your thoughts on it. Uh, if there are claims, for example, uh, against racial discrimination, the Department of Justice is still supposed to serve the interests of those who bring those claims. This is not uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I would hope that the Justice Department is doing that. In fact, that's what it's doing now uh, in Harvard and other places with respect to claims brought by uh, Asian American applicants. The idea of critical mass is it's it's a strange one because and, and indeed the whole justification for racial preferences and admissions since the Supreme Court first okayed it in uh, in kind of the modern area of jurisprudence in, in 1978 isn't for the benefit of the racial minorities. It's this diversity idea is that uh, we all learn better when we have people of different backgrounds. That, that that's the idea. So it's not uh, the Supreme Court has said that it's 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 not proper to have a remedial you know. Blacks were enslaved and then Jim Crow, and therefore we should give them some benefits now. That's not the uh, what the court has said is a legitimate rationale, uh, nor is it racial balancing. It's it's diversity because that enhances education for everyone, and, and you only get that diversity if there's, I guess, a critical mass of each different kind of, of race is, is how the theory goes. I think it's a little patronizing. I think it's uh, you know asking uh, black students to be... Uh, uh, exemplars of their race, whatever that means, so that they can teach the white students about their experience. Uh, and it does create these feelings of not belonging that, that, uh, uh, John Paul talked about. So, uh, I think what, you know, if, if the students, it's not, this is not a matter of self esteem or, you know, hiring even more, uh, university bureaucrats in the, uh, in the diversity space or what have you. It's about, uh, uh making the students, uh, uh, feel that they are, uh, as qualified and have every right to be there as, as everyone else uh, because they're uh, achieving like like everyone else. Uh, one of the reasons, I think, why we've had a lot of uh, uh, outcries about, uh, you know, uh, triggering and political correctness and so-called snowflakes on college campuses, I think, is because a lot of uh, uh, students who are clustering in kind of the lower performing uh, 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 sectors see other students that look like them and, and, and they think, well, this is clearly a white oppressive structure. Why else would we not be doing as well uh, in these various classes? So I think it is very much um, a problem. This mismatch is the name that, that some researchers call it. That uh, you know, students that are equally qualified should get to the equal to the same places, uh, regardless uh, of race. But when you're when you're giving such large artificial preferences, I mean, obviously this isn't going to this isn't going to cure what kind of background they came from, and you know, urban underfunded schools and all the rest of it. Uh, but, uh, you know, trying to fix that, uh, uh, that, that front end problem by having this back end preference really doesn't serve anybody's interest. Well, I alluded earlier to, um, legacies and athletes, and, uh, I wonder, Ilya Shapiro, what you say to a listener, Mark, who goes to this and by saying you can't talk about affirmative action without talking about the dirty, little, largely white secret at selective colleges of legacy. You think George W. Bush got into Yale and Harvard Business School based upon academic merit? Yeah, I mean that's that's certainly a problem, and I, I think the use of legacies has decreased somewhat. And um, you know, you, you you can argue, well, there's legacies and there's legacies. It's, there, there's kind of just you know just having been an alumnus versus your parents are donating twenty five million dollars, which can go to fund scholarships for a hundred students. So you know, it's it's kind of a uh, there is some nuance there. But I agree that. Uh, uh, that, that getting rid of these other kinds of preferences uh, is an issue. Although, at oral argument during the Fisher case, the University of Texas case, Justice Sotomayor said, well, hold on, uh, just as there's becoming more and more uh, alumni of selective schools who are black and Hispanic, you're going to remove these preferences. So there's even resistance, even from those who would favor racial preferences, I think, uh, to reducing some of these kinds of legacy preferences. But, but I agree, these sorts of things, uh, outside of the exceptional case where maybe you can justify Okay, well, if admitting you is going to allow us to admit a hundred other underprivileged students, maybe then that's that's worth talking about. But outside of extreme cases like that, uh, I do think that's a race-neutral uh, uh, method that that can in increase diversity without having to use racial preferences. Well, since you brought up again underprivileged students, Celia Shapiro, I want to go back to John Paul and get his response to. A listener, Javier, who comments, in my experience, a poor white male adds more diversity than me, a wealthy Mexican-American male. What do you think of replacing race-based affirmative action with economics-based affirmative action? Well, two things. I don't think it's uh, either or. Uh, and um, 
you know, the, the I agree with uh, Mr. Shapiro when he says in terms of the courts focusing on diversity. The Bucky case was not filed as a First Amendment diversity case. It was just filed as an equal protection discrimination case. It was a filed as a case trying to achieve uh, racial equity, uh, racial inclusion. That was a case at UC Davis in yeah. medical school admissions. And the court flipped it and said, no, we're not going to allow that, but we will allow diversity. Because, there, because yes, there's discrimination, and Powell talked about we're a country of minorities and whites are minorities and everybody's been discriminated against. Uh, it was just basically a lie. Uh, the, the, the condition of blacks in schools and in the country was so d- dire. And, and it's like I mentioned Potter Stewart in, in, in Michigan, uh, in a case where he talked about, yes, there's housing segregation, but we don't know why. It's a mystery. It's not a mystery. These were government actions that actually segregated um, and took wealth out of the black community, depressed people. And then when the solution came, it's like, we have no idea how this is, so we allow a little sliver called diversity. So diversity is too thin. It's much too thin. I agree with that. Um, and the goal is not to s- remove racial preference. The goal is to have racial equality and fairness uh, and to be affirmative about that. And the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment actually give Congress affirmative power to achieve that. It's not saying, let's just stop discriminating. It's like, how do we achieve an inclusive society? We have all these slaves that have been released. How do we make sure they're included? And now it's like that history is gone. We don't want to talk about that. Let's just talk about SAT scores. Um, Meritocracy. Yeah. Let's take some more calls. And let me go next to, well, actually, let me read a comment here first before I do. Uh, This is Jake who writes, poverty is a huge factor determining whether you can go full time to university. And poverty affects everyone, regardless of systemic discrimination. It has more to do with your family's wealth than anything else. The best thing we can do is to lower the cost of college for everyone. And Virgil writes, the fraud of affirmative action is that it is necessary to use race to overcome race, that the road to diversity is through race. The use of race leads to resentment by other groups of people, example, Asian students now suing suing Harvard over their admissions. And worse yet, affirmative action casts people of color as inferior or unable to compete. I'll bring another caller on here, and that's you, Simon. Welcome. Hi, um. I would like to make a comment. So let's say this is one African who, who is 10% African and then 90% Asian. And another one is actually the niece of that one. He is 100% Asian and they both apply to Harvard. The first one claimed to be African American. The second one is Asian American. So would the first one enjoy the benefit of race-based uh, affirmative action? Is that a cheat or not? Would it come down to a time Say the government has to take a gene test to decide what race you are. It, is that the? I think the United States actually is coming onto a slip slope. Well, we're and, back to uh, the admissions problem for Asian American students. Ilya Shapiro, let me get you, if if I could, to outline more what we're talking about here, because this is definitely probably headed to the Supreme Court. Yeah, um, the the problem that the caller identifies. Uh, I mean, it starts getting towards the Nazi era Nuremberg laws. How much of a given? Uh, race do you have to be to, to count that way? Uh, how do you identify yourself? College counselors advise high school students, if they're biracial, to check the box of the race that gets higher uh, racial preferences. I mean, this is, uh, you, you, you can't deny that uh, that nasty fact. What's going on with, with, with Asian Americans is their numbers of qualified applicants has grown very rapidly in the last 10, 20 years, and the admissions has not kept pace uh, at the elite institutions. And now I'm not just talking about GPA, uh, you know, grades and SAT scores. This is including extracurriculars, community service, uh, reports from alumni who interview applicants sometimes. Take all of that. Uh, and Asians are more qualified than, than every other group. Uh, nor is it that all the Asians are applying to, as a stereotype might hold, for math and science programs and the colleges want better rounded students or something. I think there's nothing wrong with, uh, in fact, you want a diversity of interest. You want some people who are going to do theater, some people who are athletes, some people who are going to be orchestra, some people who are going to spend their time in the lab, some people who do a bit of everything. I mean, yeah, that, that's great. Um, but what we're seeing is, uh, uh, again, for any given level of qualification, uh, uh, Asians have it much harder. It's easier at any given level uh, if you're white, easier, much easier if you're Hispanic, much easier still uh, if you're black. At the same level of, uh, again, going beyond simply numerical tests and, uh, and SAT scores. And that obviously creates resentment both among 
the applicant class and, and kind of in a broader society, as well as those students who end up on campus. And let me get back uh, to John Powell about this question that Simon brought up. I mean, there's the argument that one hears a post of affirmative action, it makes it more difficult to sort through because we've become so multi-ethnic and there's so many interracial couples uh, to sort through who belongs in the category and who really ought to get the respect for diversity and so forth. So so th- this is the thing, that race has never just been blood. So it's not, you know, don't take a DNA, DNA test to really figure out. Race is a social practice. Um, and what it meant to be black in the United States had nothing to do with blood. Uh, pl- Homer Plessy was an octoroon. We don't even know what Octoroon is anymore. It's one-eighth black. But he was black. He was not allowed to ride on the boxcar. And so part of it is the condition we actually subject people, subject people to, what we do collectively. And uh, Robert Sampson's written a book about this, and he talks about if you look at a number of factors, they describe the life of how we treat people and how those people's lives will unfold, not because of their blood, but because of how we treat them. So we say if race is socially constructed, what is the construction of blackness in this country? And it's not just blood. And so if we have a permanent underclass uh, that from one generation to the next generation, we exclude, regardless of who they are, whether they're Asian Americans, whether they're Native Americans, whether they are disabled, it's a problem. That's not really democracy. Democracy supposed to be about where everyone has a stake. Uh, and that's and we haven't done that as a country, and we're trying to correct it. And I'm certainly not against correcting it for any other groups. But I will say, going in terms of our history, the history was fought about what do we do with the slaves in this country. And then the three amendments was to say, we need to do something special because there's already this pernicious anxiety, hatred, fear of the freed slaves. We have not corrected that in 150 years. Here's a tweet from a listener relevant to what we're talking about. This is a tweet from Pete who says the main problem with race is that it was created as a pseudoscience to justify laws and programs set to restrict people of colors, freedoms, and depict them as subhuman. Colleges need paywalls removed so all people have access to the education the rich class has. And Rick writes, I've read that affirmative action candidates granted these precious freshman class spots at elite colleges drop out at a much greater rate. If this is true, how can this be good for anyone, including the person given this chance? Does that conform to what you know, John Paul? No, there's a book uh, called uh, The Bend in the River uh, that talks about this. I mean, people, blacks and women historically have not done well in predominantly male white institutions. It's not people are not qualified. It's that the environment is hostile. And yeah, race as a as a scientific uh, biological uh, reality is a fiction, but racism is real. And the question is, can we address it? Uh, and I think having a broad discussion of how we create an inclusive society, a society would not be healthy where all the powers were those of men. Uh, all the, the, the presidents, which is exactly what we have, are men. All the heads of corporations are men. And group-based inequality is extremely problematic. Uh, we keep talking about individuals, we, we, but we actually sort people in groups, we distribute power in groups, and we have to figure out a way of addressing that if we're going to survive in society. I wonder, uh, Ilya Shapiro, if you're familiar with a, well, <laughs> this is a long way from home here we're talking about, but there was an article uh, in the National Review about Malaysia, which has given preferences to those who were discriminated against, the Malays, uh, in Singapore, where they don't get preferences. It turns out that um, uh, those uh, that there's much more success than there is in Malaysia where they do. Um, and this is used as an example by one of the editors of the National Review to show that you know preferences don't necessarily make for more success, and yet they seem to be. Uh, we seem to be on a different uh, kind of Project trajectory here in the United States. Yeah, the United States uh, isn't alone in using racial preferences for various purposes. Uh, Brazil, I think there's something like 200 racial categories uh, in Brazil and different gradations. It's a very complicated structure. Um, different parts of the world uh, uh, do it differently. I think what's uh, what we have to realize is it's it's all well and good to talk about the great stain of slavery and how blacks haven't felt uh, included or welcome in the country for. Uh, for much of its history, um, but then the racial preferences are not going to those who are growing up underprivileged in bad schools for the most part. It's going to the upper middle class uh, uh, blacks who, you know, basically effectively making sure that we have uh, uh, different colored uh, sons and daughters of doctors and lawyers, uh, you know, that kind of 
superficial diversity uh, at the expense of, as one of your earlier callers or, or, or writers uh, said, uh, uh, poor whites or immigrant Asians, a, a, a large bit of the, the Asian American community, of course, is, is immigrant. So it's, it's more complicated than simply saying, look, uh, you know, blacks have this peculiar, unique history uh, of oppression in America, and therefore maybe we can tolerate, uh, you know, this kind of wiggle room to, to achieve true inclusivity. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is not people who are being oppressed by the system who are getting these kind of quote unquote benefits, which I would argue are actually not so good benefits, given that they end up, uh, as you said, uh, uh, flunking out, or, or uh, we talked about historically black colleges, historically black universities produce more PH, black PhDs on average uh, than the uh, th than the elite uh, general school. So it's it's a complicated kind of global system, um, but I think it's uh, the you know the more that we're provoking, are we racial balancing in the right way? Are we tweaking? the percentage amount that you can use race as a part of your admissions criteria. Is that right or should it be lowered a little bit? You know, I think that we need a, a more global rethink uh, uh, of these issues and there are very valid concerns that John Paul is raising. I just don't think they relate to efforts at, uh, at elite university admissions. Let me bring another caller on here and that's Jennifer and uh, Jennifer is a counselor. So uh, let's hear what you have to say about this, Jennifer. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, I was just wanted to make a comment about how it would be pretty difficult to remove the knowledge of the applicant's race from the application process because students write personal statements and write about their experiences and it would, you know, a lot of that has to do with the race relationships that they've had. And you're saying as a college counselor, it's it would almost be impossible to, <laughs> divert, to have a race remove, line. yeah, to remove race from yeah. uh, the whole admissions from process. Yeah, right. well, th thank you for that. I want to actually read another comment here. It's a tweet from a listener. It says, "In the United States, the problem begins much earlier than university admissions. We need pre and high schools that are designed to propel all students as far as they can go, inspiring diverse interests with diverse learning arcs." And on that thought. Let me thank our guest, Ilya Shapiro, Senior Fellow in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, Editor-in-Chief of Cato Supreme Court Review. Thank you for joining us this morning. My pleasure. And thank you, John A. Powell, who's here with us in studio, who is Director of the Haas Institute for a Fair and Inclusive Society and Professor of Law, African American Studies and Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. Thank you, Director Powell. Thanks for having me. And thank you, our listeners. We're here with you Monday through Friday, 9 to 11, with an hour repeat at 10 to 11 in the evening. And we're going to meet Tony Eitan in the hour ahead, who is fixing California's health care gap and doing at least much more than that uh, in terms of really trying to do something specific about, well, he's a believer, let me put it to you this way, that uh, uh, your um, genetic code is less important than your zip code. Stay tuned. <laughs> 